Hi, I'm Brad Brown, and thanks for watching. This is the first of a 20-week long series that I'm currently teaching on the book of Isaiah, entitled Return to Sender, subtitled A Prophetic Postman Delivers a Messianic Message with God's Stamp of Approval to a World Gone Postal. This is my eighth biblical series that I have taught, and this one is being filmed. Each week, it all starts here in this study, as well as three years of extensive advanced reading in order to prepare for such a profound book as Isaiah. And this is our first filming adventure, so the first video does get a little blurry for a very brief time, and it is quickly corrected. So with that, I hope that you enjoy this introduction, the envelope, please. And thanks again for going on this YouTube journey with us. All right, well, let me officially welcome you to a journey we're going to all go on together. It's called Return to Sender, if you didn't already know. Subtitled, <coughs> a Prophetic Postman Delivers a Messianic Message with God's Stamp of Approval to a World Gone Postal. And if you don't think I've used enough mail analogies, you just wait. <laughs> um, and this is my eighth extended Bible series, and some of you might even wonder, it's like, man, you're 60. It's like, you know, I've been teaching Sunday school since I was like 20. It's like only eight. It's like, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I didn't really start doing them until I really felt the need in the local church. I felt like, you know, according to the prophet Amos, there was a famine in the land. Not that I was any great shakes, but I really thought that, okay, we're doing way too many topical things. Everyone's kind of talking and doing their own opinion kind of thing. And our, our Sunday school class was, was kind of going into a different route back in California. So I thought, what if we did a 14-week-long study on the life of King David? And I called it Eight Weddings and a Funeral. And it was unheard. I was like, what? You mean you can have a, the same subject for 14 weeks? Yeah, there's no Facebook even by then, right? Anyway, we did it. It seemed like it, it worked well, so I kept doing them. And, but they, they took a lot of time. They took a lot of effort. I loved it. It's, what, it's in my wheelhouse. I love doing that kind of stuff. Curling up on the fire with a good commentary is paradise to me. And uh, so that was fun. But over the course of my ministry in teaching Sunday schools, um, there had been only eight of them. But this one was an interesting animal as well. As you probably all well know with even a, a cursory familiarity with the book of Isaiah. I got into this thing and realized, of course, that I had a tiger by the tail. And most people who read this thing feel the same way. And um, so I, I've tried at least to, to uh, give you everything I've got for as long as it takes, even if it means suffering for Jesus by postponing <laughs> something just Forever. once. Forever. In a Baptist Forever. church is supposed to exhibit grace at some level, but just once did I postpone it, realizing the tiger by the tail and realizing that I, I was ready, but I wanted to, to go another <coughs> level deeper. And, uh, and so that's what I did. So your number eight Bible series, this is the third one I've done here at Encompass Church. Um, here's my philosophy, that um, this is the result definitely of a very lengthy pearl dive uh, into the vast ocean that is the 66 books of Isaiah, which hopefully we will all come away from changed and with a better handle on this tiger by the tail. It is the most, he is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament, to be sure, uh, with approximately 61 references right up there with the Psalms and Deuteronomy in the New Testament. So Isaiah is special. He's really calling the shots at so many levels of New Testament theology because he's all over the place, particularly in the four Gospels. Um, and it's my experience that I would like to go away as the introvert that I am. I know it's hard to believe, but it is true. Um, and I immerse myself as deeply as possible in everything I get my hands on that we are about to explore. And then I like to come back, in this case three years later, and get you so that we can go on the journey together. And that's what's happened, and that's why we're starting today. Uh, this is not mastery by any stretch. So if your expectations are that, they ought not to be. Uh, but this is rather a sense of familiarity and a sense of discovery about all the aspects of the life and times of this man, Isaiah, as best as I can articulate when I come face to face 
with inerrant holy writ, which is an intimidating process. That's why those teachers <laughs> always get more judgment, according to James. And uh, so we try to look at this stuff and go, okay, this is, the, this is the best I can come up with, with something that's so grand and so sublime. And, um, but it's been a hoot of a journey trying to uh, piece this all together. And I hope you enjoyed today. We're going to have some fun today and kind of just whet your appetite a little bit about where we're, where we're at and where we're going. Uh, but it's a, this is a lot like the report of the spies Joshua and Caleb, who of the 12 spies in 1400 BC, they were the ones that came back with the positive, you know, the positive MO or the positive report. Uh, there are truly giants in the land when you study the book of Isaiah, to be sure. But also, we will be surrounded by some very <laughs> practical, life-giving, and hopefully life-changing milk and honey all along the way. So how does one begin Return to Sender, a study that will probably go, I've mapped it out, to be about 20 weeks, just to do it some sense of justice. And I realize that it's so grandiose and so widespread and so influential, and we have picked and chosen all sorts of verses all over the place in our culture, even now today, and especially at Christmas time, as I know you know. So how would we best to approach this today with the very first introduction, which I'm calling the envelope, please. And that would be to bring this thing down to something very, very real, which it was. So, I want to transport you back 2,739 years ago as we prepare for an encounter with what many commentators and theologians and scholars call the Prince of the Prophets. Here we go. It is, a seven, it is 711 BC in a modest home despite the dual household incomes tucked in a crowded residential enclave of the capital city of Jerusalem. Mrs. I, after a busy day barking orders as a prophetess, has miraculously found time enough to prepare dinner for her husband and her two oddly named boys. A remnant will return, and his younger brother, swift to plunder and quick to carry away. By the time Mr. I, or Salvation of the Lord, returns home from work, they are all three sitting around the table, like the poor Cratchit family awaiting their beloved Bob, with the food in front of them getting colder by the minute. But the food is not the only thing that's cold. On this very chilly Judean night, Mr. I walks through the front door shivering. <clears throat> he is naked except for a short, flimsy loincloth. The returning prophet sees the surprised looks on the three faces staring wide-eyed back at him and simply says with a shrug of his bare shoulders, God told me to do it. The boys knew that their father and mother had odd jobs that occasionally made them do strange things. And they were getting used to it. After all, they were well aware of that crazy friend and old business partner of their father's, Micah, who lived about 20 miles to the south. But even more jarring were the reports from up north of that old codger Hosea, still spouting God talk while married to his hussy wife Gomer. A Canaanite strumpet to the stars, they called her. And even though they did not have very much room to talk, the two boys still wondered what was with the names of Hosea and Gomer's three kids. God scatters, not loved, and not my people. It was a relief when wizened Jose had the good sense to change their names a few years later. Mrs. I, once again, was not surprised by the erratic behavior of her scantily clad husband. It came with the job, or Job. So, rather mechanically, Isaiah's prophetess wife quietly gets up from the table, walks toward the peg protruding from the wall by the door, from which dangled a sheepskin mantle. Given her unique profession, she was still quite unaware that Mr. I's birthday suit fashion show was going to be on tour for the next three years, as would be measured by an anxious slave longing to be free. On her way to the makeshift coat rack, Mrs. I could not help asking, even while her back was turned, hey, whatever happened to that burlap coat my mother made you for Passover? It goes so good with your ashes. 
<laughs> that itchy thing, Mr. I exclaimed from behind. There was a detectable vibrato in his voice, the obvious result of his frigid constitution. <laughs> Mrs. I returns to the table and unobtrusively wraps the cape around her husband, his arms now folded against his bare chest to quell the teeth chattering above. He sits down at the dinner table, takes a few lukewarm bites, and then glances down at the headline, jumping out of the newspaper, the Temple Tribune, neatly trifolded by his dinner plate just how he likes it. Mr. I picks it up, unfolds it, and shakes it out, which now covers his face. Now all the other three family members can see are the BC comics on the back of the paper, and the deep resonant voice of their prophetic father commenting from behind the parchment periodical. Well, it's happened. That sorry Sargon and his little tartan minion have finally captured Ashdod. I told you it was just a matter of time, Ethiopian <laughs> dynasty, my eye. This was alarming news indeed, since their father had started in this business 30 years ago. Assyria, that little empire lying dormant and harmless for half a century, with rumors persisting that this was in great measure due to some very pointed words by a reluctant fish-smelling prophet named Jonah way back in 782 BC, and the miraculous conversion of some 120,000 barbaric Ninevites. Well, it had now come roaring to superpower status, rampaging in a southwesterly direction with Egypt in its crosshairs and ravaging everything in its path as Assyria made its vengeful way to the Mediterranean coast. Ashdod was one of the five great Philistine cities when giants roamed the earth. Not so great anymore. It serves that we clean Yamani right said the grave voice from behind the curtain of newspaper. He was referring, of course, to the Egyptian revolt against Assyria in which Philistine Ashdod had been convinced to take part. Sargon's own bodyguard was dispatched to take out that milk toast Yamani, the voice again, vaulting over the Temple Tribune. No surprise that that coward ran for his life back to Egypt. There was what the boys detected as a satisfied laugh from the newspapers backstage. Not a sinister laugh, but definitely of the I told you so variety. Bound and gagged and delivered COD back to Assyria by turncoat Egypt. Isaiah abruptly turned the newspaper around and there, below the headline, put your money where your mouth is, was a picture of the sad, dejected former regent of Ashdod. Photograph. I'm so glad my father isn't around to see this. Mr. I was muttering. He was referring to his own late father, Amos, with a Z. Not to be confused with that grizzled prophet rancher, Amos, with an S, whose large spread was somewhere up north. Mr. I's father had always wanted his son to go into a more conventional career. Their relationship was strained following that eventful year when King Uzziah died, and Isaiah had to confess to his dad afterwards that he had with much tongue-tied chagrin, pointed himself out to an even greater dad with words like, here I am and send me, thereby volunteering himself for the ride of his life these past 29 years. Mr. I puts down the paper and looks intently at the three rapt faces looking back at him. It was a look with which they were quite familiar. He was about to make a point. <clears throat> this is what happens when you jump into bed with those sun god-worshipping Egyptians. Raw indeed. They are quaking in their boots from Thebes to Memphis. Why, you ask? They hadn't, but he went on anyway. <laughs> because they are about to experience the same fate as poor Yamani. They are going to be as naked as jaybirds trapped in an Assyrian cage. Let me guess, said Mrs. I, ever the prophetess, and fully aware of how her husband was never undercover, but rather liked to stir up the imagination of his listeners so that he might arouse their interest. And this nudist camp stunt was just one more way to teach them an eyeful of God's truth. Especially revealing was his talk of Yahweh's endless closet full of righteous robes with one she thought in particular being quite necessary right about now. <laughs> that is why you have no clothes on, she mused. 
God told you to strip down to your skivvies to advertise against wanting to go back to Egypt, alluding to their ancestors' home sickness going back over 600 years. Mr. I looked down at his exposed, scrawny body and then looked back up at his wife and silently admitted, yes. But none of this point-making matrimonial symbiosis between streaker and helpmate placated either of their boys. Both a remnant will return, and swift to plunder and quick to carry away, sat rigid and terrified, leaving their cold food untouched since their father had explained how was his day. Even while they sat around the table, mighty Assyria was on the march. To the boys' panic-stricken manner of thinking, coupled with their father's repeated predictions, it had just been a matter of time before the northern kingdom, their neighbor, Israel, had fallen into Assyrian hands. Did their current king, Hezekiah, even stand a chance, especially after having such a godless wimp for a father? And now, Philistine Ashdod has been destroyed. A chill ran up their young spines as they realized with horror that all of this front page news was taking place only 33 miles from their front porch. The boys' terror was not unfounded. They had lived all their lives under this threatening shadow of terrorist Assyrian expansion. First, northern Israel and then southern Judah lay directly in the path of that expansion. The hefty taxes paid by the northern kingdom of Israel to Assyria, Assyria had only been an appetizer for the whole region to eventually be gobbled up. When Judah's old king Jotham, pay, paving the way, acting as co-regent with his son Ahaz, they finally made a pact with Assyria to save their own skin, making them dangerously dependent upon the evil empire. Ever in competition with their northern sister, southern Judah would not complain, which it didn't, if Israel were cut down to size, or even if Israel were completely destroyed, which it was. After all, that pesky warlord king of Israel, Pekah, had already shacked up with their northern neighbor, Syria, and together they mounted an unwarranted attack on Judah. As a result of this sibling rivalry, ever since the nation had split in two some 225 years earlier, the southern kingdom of Judah had had a front row seat for a full three years as the city of Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, experienced the horrors of siege warfare at the hands of the sadistic Assyrians, and the northern kingdom <clears throat> crumbled. Samaria had fallen just 10 years ago, Reigning 26-year-old King Isaiah, Isaiah, while definitely anti-Assyrian, was apparently putting a lot of stock in another so-called Egyptian alliance. At least it was rumored that his counselors were pressuring him in that direction. This was a great irritation to their father, who often called their world scene tumultuous. Unaffected by current events, however, Isaiah's prophetess wife just sat and stared admiringly at her one-of-a-kind husband, <laughs> who was truly just that. In the book of Isaiah, unlike all of the other prophets, whether they are called major or minor, Isaiah does not speak about future times. He does not. Uniquely so, he rather speaks <clears throat> to future times just as if Isaiah was actually there. Now that would be quite a feat when the prophet only, only ministered for 55 years, from 740 B.C. down to 685 B.C. But some commentators, God bless them, really have a problem with a ministry that simultaneously focuses on the present as well as the future to tell forth the word of God, as well as foretell the works of God. Using immediate circumstances to illustrate upcoming events with alarming accuracy. Now, supposedly bolstered by certain stylistic and vocabulary differences that changed throughout the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, but are well within the range of one author's capabilities and moods over time, 
These progressive commentators have attempted over the years to solve the predictive prophecy problem by, hear this now, making Isaiah into three different people covering over three different time periods. So, according to their collective wisdom, the collective wisdom that is out there, it goes like this. Chapters 1 through 39 of the book of Isaiah were written during and address Isaiah's own lifetime. We would say no miracle there. 740 B.C. down to 700 B.C. And so they call him Proto-Isaiah. Proto-Isaiah is really just another phrase for the real Isaiah. But we're not done yet. Chapters 40 to 55, well, they address the Judean exiles in Babylon, a power that hadn't even arisen to power yet. That's from 585 B.C. and 540 B.C. So that's 150 years after Isaiah's own lifetime. Well, that can't be. That's called predictive prophecy. That's a miracle. That can't possibly be, even though the thing was written erroneously by the hand of God. It can't be. Therefore, that has now been written, chapters 40 to 55, that's been written by a second author. We'll call him Deutero-Isaiah. Are you with me now? Okay, author number one, Proto-Isaiah. Author number two, Deutero-Isaiah. It gets worse. Chapters 56, 56 to 66, address Judah after her return from exile in 539 B.C. down to 500 B.C. This is a full 200 years after Isaiah's lifetime. That can't, that can't be. So that has now been written by a third Trito Isaiah. You get this? So now we have, remember this now for the quiz, okay? <laughs> Proto-Isaiah, no miracle there. Deutero-Isaiah, hmm, predicting 150 years in advance? Mm hmm, I don't think so. And then finally, Trito-Isaiah, hmm, 200 years in advance predictions. Hmm, I, we're too progressive in this day and age of the 21st century. We can't possibly believe that that could possibly happen unless we've got these three authors. Well, a number of problems, as you can imagine, arise from this dubious multiple authorship solution. First of all, there's no objective evidence whatsoever. Second of all, there's no biblical precedent whatsoever. There is even, number three, no agreement among the purveyors of this theory. There's a shock. With timeline differences of their own opinions creating gaps as much as 300 years. And ask yourself this question, number four. And why would the three author musketeers, Proto, Deutero, and Trito, <laughs> or even God for that matter, why would they deliberately deceive their readership by asking them to believe that each of their contributions were in fact still the work of Isaiah ben Amos from the 8th century B.C.? We need to look no further, folks, than verse 1 of chapter 1 of Isaiah's contribution to the inerrant, inspired word of God for our answer. So, as we start this series, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation for this series. But let me just read to you chapter 1, verse 1 of Isaiah. These are the visions that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He saw these visions during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. I have a period there, don't you? Period! That's it! Why all this progressive debate and why, why have musketeers proto Deutero and Trito solve the problem for us? That I don't know. It is right here that we are all asked, as we embark on this journey together, we are asked this. We are asked to believe that this person, Isaiah, in the 700s B.C., foresaw what was going to happen to his people over the next several hundred years and conceived a great theological structure to address not only those times, but ones further in the future. I'm quoting from John Oswald, a great scholar on Isaiah. They say Isianic scholar. Yeah, that's the big theological word. Uh, this is from the NIVAC is what they call it. 
the new it is he Isaiah who received the revelations from God and who directed the shaping of this book that quote is also from John Oswald part one this is a two-parter of the book of Isaiah in what they call the Nicot, which is the new international commentary on the Old Testament and for whatever it's worth I devoured both these books from cover to cover as part of the preparation for this series he's a great writer He's conservative, he's well thought out, he's extremely biblical, and obviously knowledgeable. So let me give you one concession. At the very least, according to scholars and commentators, there may be a 15-year prophetic hiatus between the writings of chapters 1 through 39 of the book of Isaiah that you have in the lab, and chapters 40 to 66. But get this, they're all within Isaiah's own lifetime, so it's fine. Now, let me just bolster this one more time. So here's the New Testament, solidly backing up a portion of Isaiah's messianic predictions, among all the other predictions, 770 years before Jesus was born. That's a lot more than 200. And they do so without any second thoughts or hesitation. So flip over to the book of John. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 37. John 12, verse 37. And what I want you to notice here is, notice, no second thoughts. Notice the no hesitations. Notice the period after the sentence, which is bigger than life. Verse 37, John chapter 12. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. <clears throat> Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe. For as Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Verse 41. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Period. According to the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, there are no second or third Isaiahs to explain away any miraculous predictive prophecies. No matter, no matter. Many modern-day thinkers and scholars just can't bear to receive, among others, any revelatory, what I'll call, Dear John letters. And we've got a doozy at the end of your Bible. And thus try to explain them all away. If they try to do that, they're dabbling in holy writ, folks, and they do so to their own peril. Turn over to Revelation chapter 22. <coughs> Revelation chapter 22. I just want you to cogitate over this possibility. <coughs> Revelation 22, near the very end of the inspired word of God. And it says this. And again, this is God speaking through John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who just gave you that explanatory note in chapter 12 of his gospel about the predictive prophecy of Isaiah and didn't give it a second glance. Here's what he says about his book of Revelation. And I solemnly declare, verse 18, to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. Wow. Now, I understand that this is specifically addressing the book of Revelation, but have you ever thought about this as a tone of intentionality? Could it be possible that the miracle denying, messing with prophetic authorship, those people just might be included in those who are adding or taking away? Be very careful because the stakes are high. With that, let's now return to Jerusalem, where the stakes are getting cold. <laughs> Mr. I has, finishes now his lukewarm dinner. He wipes his mouth on a napkin, and he asks his prophetess wife if there was any mail today. Oh, just one letter, as she points to the low table by the front window. 
Mr. I gets up from the table and retrieves the letter. He sits back down, looking at the letter with his family watching intently. It's from God, he says matter-of-factly. I recognize the return address. <laughs> the return address simply says, heaven, a place Mr. I had visited nearly 30 years earlier. He cautiously opens the seal of the envelope while the other three members of the Hovis family lean forward with anticipation. Once the envelope is turned upside down and gently shaking, out drops two well-worn postcards. Each depict before and after photographs of both Sodom and Gomorrah, two of the old five cities of the plain way back in Abraham's day that had gotten themselves into some serious trouble. Mr. I gets God's point immediately. This is exactly why we are in the current mess we are in, both nationally and personally, he exclaims, never taking his eyes off the dramatic pictures held tightly in each of his shaking hands. Pride, rebellion, unfaithfulness, you name it. There's something else, his wife interjects. It seems a small piece of parchment had fluttered down to the table surface when Mr. I let fall the contents of the envelope. He picked it up. He studied its divine message and what it portended. What does it say, honey? asked prophetess to prophet. Mr. I looked around the table at them all, recalling the rather lengthy introduction that he had recently completed for his upcoming best-selling book, simply titled Isaiah, which, would, which many would tout as the greatest book in an ever-expanding testament that would never grow old. He looked back down with a new sense of alarm at the scrap of paper in his hand and read out loud, postcards from the edge, which seemed to be exactly where Jerusalem was standing these days. For the next 20 weeks or so, using the New Living Translation, we will be following Zeke's wheelhouse and his commission, written nearly 150 years after Isaiah, says this, Son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart, Listen to them carefully for yourself, and then go to your people. Exodus 3, 10 to 11. In other words, we are going to develop the envelope, please, by unfolding what has been enfolded into the 66 chapters of this profound and gripping book as we all return to the sender. Now, this envelope is not just being handed to Isaiah, as one might suppose, but rather to each and every one of us. First, describing our own individual postcards from your edge that seek to envelop us. 770 years after Isaiah picked up his mail, a child is born to us. A son is given to us. Why? Because 1,986 years later, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And a holy God with us, who is in sovereign charge of all peoples and nations, whether superpowers that seek to swamp us or little sins that seek to distract us, he is king over our destiny. And so that the sins of man, great and small, would never annul the promises of God, a suffering servant was sent to conquer once and for all the problem by having the Lord lay on him the sins of us all, giving him a whipping so deadly that it permanently marked him with healing stripes for us all. With all the other governments resting squarely on his shoulders, the resurrected Father Prince is going to return to set up his own brand of endless governing. This, then, is the most wonderful counsel we could ever receive. Only returning to him and resting in him will we be saved. We are now each personally challenged to develop the antonym envelope, and by that I mean this. Envelope. Do you know it has an antonym? An antonym or, or an opposite, okay? 
So when I say envelope, it could actually be pronounced envelope, okay? So if I'm saying to you and I, we are going to, by the Spirit of God, ask God to develop us over the next 20 weeks and change us like never before, discover things we've never thought of before, and be different as never before, we need to develop or develop. <laughs> as we should say because that's how it's spelled and that's what it means so if I develop I take what has been enveloped and I develop it that means that Isaiah if I develop the envelope at the risk of looking sounding really cute but that really helps with retention by the way when I develop the envelope and peel off all the layers Isaiah becomes my Isaiah why? because I'm taking responsibility to develop the envelope so that I develop spiritually. I've got to peel off all these layers. I've got to shed what entraps me. I've got to discard all that limits me, spiritually speaking, so that I can surrender and be submissive to God and His Word. So I develop the envelope, I tear off all of these layers, however many we have, until I finally expose my home address, which is, here I am. And so, next week, we will begin with Isaiah's salutation, which really is a five-chapter salute that is not so much a greeting as it is the firing of a cannon into the 21st century. Homework for the return journey next week, if you so desire, would be for you to read the first five chapters, which is a preface or an introduction made from selections of messages that Isaiah had preached over the years that perfectly describe the situation in which both he and us have found ourselves and from which both he and us have now been called. Pictured in living color on next week's Postcards from the Edge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for a chance, an opportunity to explore this incredible book. How sublime, how deep, it's mesmerizing, it's overwhelming, and it's all you. And the minute we, we even traffic in, even lightly, some of these verses and passages, we realize that we're in your territory, maybe deeply in your territory, maybe in over our head in your territory. But I pray as a result of that that this series would change us as we return to you, the sender. Ask what you want. Surrender what we want. Submit to what you want to do through us, what you want to do first in us. I pray that this would be a life-changing experience. You'd be with me as I research and explore, that we would um, look at this together as a unit, all of us together, approaching these scriptures with submission, with transparency, with a, our hands wide open so that you can do whatever you wish to do and change us like we've never been changed before because this is a book like never before. And that can only be done by the power of your spirit. And I pray that he would be just that powerful. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. That's just who he is. So really what's left is for us to yield. I pray that we would. And I pray that this would be just a magnificent journey for all of us together that would give you just great, supreme, sovereign glory as we go on this rampage through the 66 chapters of Isaiah. Your servant, this incredible man who lived 2,700 years ago with his prophetess wife and his two boys, a man just like you, just like me, and just like everyone in this class. And I just thank you so much for the way you used him, whether way you used his family, and I pray that we would glean much from him by way of example and marching orders from you directly. So in the name of Jesus, we pray all these things, who is truly the author and perfecter of our faith, and that we might get to know him even better as a result of this journey as well. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 See you next week.